And now we're going to shift and we're going to hear from your peers. And back by popular demand, we are going to have an innovation session. And this was what we had hosted last year with several health plans and palliative care providers uh, sharing their innovations to address challenges and needs in the area of quality and operations and workflow, payment and sustainability, clinical service delivery, and of course, partnerships. And last year, while the innovation spanned a number of those areas, they tended to focus a little bit on quality. We heard about a dashboard, we heard about a SharePoint system that providers submitted data to regularly. And one of the palliative care providers had their own internal set of measures and were using that as an effective quality tool. This year we have three innovations and while they span a few of these areas, again, looking at clinical service delivery and payment sustainability, they've all landed in this area of partnerships. And so we are going to learn from the, for the three of them today about what they've addressed in order to build these sustainable partnerships and of course, sustainable programs. Before I begin and introduce our first presenter, I just wanna remind you, please, please, please use the chat box, uh, write your questions. Our presenters are gonna have about 15 minutes to do a presentation with their slide deck, five minutes for some very specific questions. And at the end of the three presentations, we're gonna open it up. We'll have about 15 minutes to hear your questions and have our panelists to respond to those. So that, and again, just a final note that our bios, uh, the presenter's bios are in the handout. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marvin Gordon, who is the Regional Medical Director for HealthNet and take it away, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. So if you wanna go on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about HealthNet. Uh, we go by a variety of names. Uh, we do have the Legacy Rural Centene Program, which is California Health and Wellness. We also do a countywide program up in the Central Valley, Calviva. We also, when we acquired WellCare, that will be the name of our senior product. So we're using WellCare by HealthNet. So when I talk about palliative care and HealthNet, I'm talking about all of these entities. The actual palliative care program goes back to 2014. We cover about 2.1 million Medi-Cal members. We have 15 vendors covering 41 counties. Average daily census runs oh, about 340. We do have dedicated staff at HealthNet, one manager, three nurses, one coordinator. It's a home-based model. And we add, of course, telehealth, which I think everyone has added. We do the monthly case rate. And then what we do do is, uh, because there's different, different levels of intensity, we actually have different payment tiers. So within the monthly case rate, it can be one of several different tiers of service. One thing we do require that's a little bit different than the SB1004 is we do require the 24 seven phone line and availability of services. And also a little different from SB1004, we do any diagnosis and the communication with the provider three rounds. So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about our innovation, which is community healthcare workers. And what we really want to do is facilitate the work being done by our physicians, our social workers, other professional staff. So we think we can improve the clinical service delivery, basically foster better partnerships, improve operations and workflow. And in doing that, create a more cost effective system, which means more sustainability. There's two projects I'll talk about. One is going to be in Northern California, this is in the rural counties, uh, that's Tehama, Butte, Glen, that area. And our partnership was with Resolution Care, which is now known as Vinca. And you probably may know it more as uh, the palliative provider uh, associated with Dr. Michael Fratkin, who's there. The other program we did with community healthcare workers is way down south in San Diego. And I'll explain a little more about what this neighborhood networks is. So go to the next slide, we can talk about, you know, what are we trying to address? So in the rural setting up in the north, uh, what we're really trying to do is cut down the driving time. I mean, it is just, again, uh, long distances between, you know, the provider and the home. So we want to make more efficient use of staff time. So with two things that we do with the community health care workers, one is we can make the telehealth visit more meaningful. They can help with the technology part. And in addition, 
they can still take the time to do the social determinant of health evaluation, which is something our community health care workers know about. Now, if you go down to San Diego, it's not really so much palliative care as it was how do we use community health care workers for our high cost, high risk members? And the idea was if we can find community health care workers from the local neighborhood, that's the whole idea behind neighborhood networks. Then we can remediate, identify, and remediate the social determinants of health in a face to face environment. Obviously, with COVID, it was a great idea at the time, but 2020 was not the year to start this. In addition, we came up with another idea. Why don't we use home based community health care workers to help close HEDIS care gaps? And once again, the influence of peers from the local community who members would trust, we think could make better inroads into getting results. And then most recently, when we have come up with it, we knowing that there are racial disparities in the HEDIS care gaps, we developed a program, and I'll talk about our partner there, with the emphasis on the SDOH and also a screenings, again, specifically looking at certain racial disparities. So if you go to the next slide, what this really is, is about community health care workers making home visits, making a palliative telehealth visit more effective, minimizing windshield time for the physicians, the nurses, and the social workers. And then, of course, our community health care workers are the experts in doing the social determinant screening during the home visit. And they have not only the expertise, but the time to do it. And once again, what we talked about earlier, what is it that members are resistant to something that is voluntary, reflects their wishes, is free, better quality? And I think part of it is trust. And that's one of the ideas behind the community health care workers. It is their peer from their neighborhood, someone they can trust who can explain what this palliative care is about. Obviously, we had the problem of COVID which means home visits were very difficult. Low volume, which I think you've heard about, everybody is saying, how do we get more members into palliative care? Uh, we also have the problem of employee turnover. And the kind of results that we don't have a whole lot of numbers as to what happened. We do, however, know that we can make this model work. So it is feasible. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see who are our innovation partners. So way up in the north, it's Resolution Care, which is Vinca. And the community health care workers were actually the health net employees who serve that area. Way down in the south in San Diego, it's Neighborhood Networks. What Neighborhood Networks is, it's part of the Accountable Community for Health, which is part of the San Diego Wellness Collaborative. So it's really a whole group of community-based organizations coming together and forming what is really a business model, neighborhood networks, where we as a payer can go to neighborhood networks, contract with them, and they will subcontract out to different community health care workers, depending on the geographic, you know, ethnic groups that we want to address. So if it's a Hispanic community, it may be the permanent tourist, uh, we have others for the African American community, et cetera. Also, we're partnering, especially on the pediatric with Radies Children's. If you're not familiar with Radies Children's, this is actually a huge pediatric network. It's hospital, PCPs, IPA model, staff model, specialists. So they're really the predominant pediatric provider in San Diego. And again, very excited to use community healthcare workers to assist them. And then of course there's HealthNet and we have to get our various departments, uh, including palliative care, our quality people, our population health. As you can see, our program really across a number of departments. So if you get to the next slide, the resources we use, we use what's called the Pathways Community Hub Model. Uh, this is something developed by Dr. Mark Reddy in Ohio. It's nationally recognized. If you want the details, you can just go on the website for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and they actually have the whole hub pathways manual on there. And what it really consists of is there's the social determinant screening tool. And then once you identify a social determinant, 
they have a pathway for remediation. So for example, housing, it would give you a step-by-step -step for what the community health care workers should do to remediate the housing problem. And then what they also have done is develop a software program that allows them to track the process and tabulate the outcomes. So that's our neighborhood network uh, resource. And then the next slide, we talk about what are the surprises? Well, what was kind of a predictable surprise is there is definitely a gap between community services and clinical services and the community-based organizations and the healthcare-based organizations definitely need to bridge that gap. Uh, we also found out, which probably is not also a big surprise, is community healthcare workers are really not used to working with the primary care physicians. And I think many of us having worked with doctors kind of get immune to the fact that doctor's offices are really, it's a busy place, complex uh, place, and probably is intimidating to someone without a medical background. And I'll explain one of the things, programs we did is to actually put the community healthcare worker in the PCP office to really overcome that unfamiliarity with it. Uh, and remember, the community healthcare workers don't really have a strong background in the medical portion, in the clinical disease part. But in addition, they also don't necessarily know how to manage the managed care system. In fact, our most frequent question was, I, the member says, I had a referral for something. My doctor put it in a month ago. I haven't heard anything. What do I do? And we actually developed a pathway on what do you do when a member says it's the famous lost referral. So two parts, the medical and the managed care system. Now, there was kind of one happy surprise. And what we did add to our San Diego social disparities program is since the community health care worker is in the PCB office, we said, why don't we let them help do the follow-up when the ACE screenings, because again, office is busy. This is that famous one more thing for the PCP to do. And the community healthcare workers are actually uh, very excited about being able to assist. So again, this is where we've actually helped the PCP office in their workflow. And if you go to the last slide or the next slide, I say, what are kind of the innovation learnings? Now, this is something that I have been saying for years in working with the accountable community down in San Diego. I have no question that community-based organizations have value. And the American way in our capitalistic system is, if you have val value, it should merit compensation. However, the one thing I did say to the community-based organizations is you need the data to show that you're, you are valuable. In other words, you need to have data to support the value proposition. And what you're really doing is creating a partnership. Neither party can do it alone. Community-based organizations need to partner with the healthcare, who are really the payers. And the payers, the health plans, really need, and it's more than just partner with the community. We really need to embrace the community because we need to bridge that gap between healthcare and community. And that I think is part of what will lead to more palliative care referrals in the long run, when we really can get down to the community level rather than just the medical level. And on the last slide here, this is where Monique said, uh, can you summarize everything in one sentence? So if anyone is dozed off and you're saying, what did Marv just say over the past 10 minutes? This is it. Community healthcare workers are absolutely a valuable asset in caring for what you want to call them complicated, complex, high risk. But in those Medi-Cal members, we need the help. And we need to work with the PCP. But the community healthcare workers do need training in clinical basics and how to navigate the managed care system. So that's a little bit about our experience. Like I said, a little disappointing with COVID that we really couldn't get more data. Uh, but definitely a great program. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Fratkin from uh, Resolution Care is still on. So when we get questions and answers, he may be able to shed some light on the details of what they did. 
That, that would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. And, and again, we encourage all of you to respond with some comments or thoughts in chat. And we've had a few already really recognizing the, the valuable nature and contributions of CHWs. Before we get to some of those, uh, there's a question here of whether CHWs are LVNs. Can you talk a little bit more about the process? You mentioned some of your community partners engaging the community health workers, but talk a little bit about the sort of the engagement hiring selection process that you know of so that there's a little rounded out picture of who might be um, engaged for this really important role. You know, these are not LVNs. These are non-professional. These are people from the community. Promotorists would be a good example. They do have some training. So you're not just taking someone off the street. In this case, Resolution Care actually had our community health care workers come into their office and do training, which was great. But the key here is you want someone with a little bit of knowledge of medical, a little knowledge of managed care so they can help the members. But the key is they're from their community. They are peers. They're the down-to-earth people that can take what we in the medical world think people understand let's face it we talk medical leads and this is the people on the ground who really are the trusted sources of information so i would say it's more peers so no it is not an idea of to get nurses out there this is truly community based and those organizations are already there i can tell you for us they do covid vaccinations uh we have them now you know working in communities uh we have them you know, training them. So I think this is just beginning. And the key with our neighborhood network model is as long as we can show the value, then it is something that payers are willing to pay for. So I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah. And, and just sort of piggybacking on that a little bit, talk a little bit. You have these two programs. So there's two innovative ways. And of course, in the San Diego program, we learned that they are learning and getting sort of embedded in some of the PCP offices and can be catalysts for, uh, of course, making referrals, but getting to know some of those processes. Talk a little bit, a little, a little bit about how long they're involved, because we know that there's different approaches, certainly for um, palliative care out in the community. There may be different tiers and how long people are involved by, by discipline. So we've got, again, your two different project models. If you can talk about how engaged and how long the community health workers are in those two projects, that would be helpful. Yeah, I think the simple answer is as long as needed. But the idea is to use hub pathways, because it's a very structured model. The social determinant of health assessment, and I think that's more in the half hour range. Okay. So yeah, it does take some time to do it, which is why a community health care worker has the time, probably the doctor in the office does not. Then once you identify the social determinant, it really depends how many uh, areas you develop. So if, if the only problem is you know, um, transportation, Okay, that's, that's kind of easy. That's probably you know, a one day, here's the resources. However, if they have housing, that takes longer. Now, if they have housing, finance, and transportation, and medical, that's something that may go on for weeks and weeks. And we found most of the cases, you're going to have multiple social determinants. And therefore, the time period, I'm going to say, is probably at least a month, possibly okay. All right, with that, um, Dr. Gordon, we're gonna wrap up your role, but we're bringing you back after the last of our innovation presentations to have an open panel with the three of you together. Right. So if you uh, would be so kind as to go ahead and turn off your camera and we're going to uh, welcome Phaedra Coons, who is the Director of Palliative Care and Business Services for Elizabeth Hospice, and she will be sharing her presentation for about 15 minutes and we'll leave a few minutes, of course, for some one-on-one -on -one questions uh, with Phaedra. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Monique. Um, it's a pleasure to be here presenting today on a very important topic to palliative care providers out there on innovation and sustainability. So I was excited to, to be invited here today. Um, first, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about, next slide please, um, our program and how we got to be where we are today. Um, the Elizabeth Palliative Care Program um, is under the parent company of the Elizabeth Hospice uh, in San Diego County. We also service um, the Southwest Riverside County um, as well. We started our 
community-based palliative care program in about 2014. Um, it was a pilot program at that time, uh, and meaning that our funding came through uh, philanthropy through our hospice. So it was a bit of an experiment, uh, and I call it the time of, of felt like uh, being in the wild, wild west, because there were no rules and no reimbursement uh, that was a conventional reimbursement structure. So we were just out there learning and uh, providing care to a very important uh, group of people that either didn't want hospice or weren't quite eligible or seeking aggressive treatment. Um, so once reimbursement and profit became uh, a requirement of the program, uh, we had to reinvent the program, so to speak. And that all happened over the course of 2016, 17. And then ultimately in 2018, uh, we applied for a Medicare Part B license, which enabled us to bill for fee for service uh, provider visits. We also obtained our first per member per month contract with a health plan, uh, which one was a Medicare. Cal managed care organization, uh, and the other was a commercial payer. So that's really when we started to get into kind of the mainstream of a defined, understandable program. Um, and so it was a big turning point for us that year. Uh, that's also when we started to really pursue contracts. Uh, before that, it had been really difficult. Uh, there were a lot fewer plans out there offering home-based palliative care uh, contracts. So that has been going on ever since 2018. Um, we are Joint Commission certified uh, for palliative care, as is our hospice. Um, we are very proud to have a pediatric palliative care uh, program, which we started in about 2020. Um, it is led by our pediatric hospice team expert. So the, the those uh, providing uh, the home-based services on our adult program um, do not provide uh, pediatric care. So it's, it's really a wonderful program. Um, it has been particularly well received by the Medi-Cal managed care organizations. Um, so we're real proud of that. Um, I already mentioned where we service um, and our average daily census is right around 80 patients. Um, and that number did spike during COVID. Uh, so we, we managed to increase our census by twofold in the last couple of years. And that is part of our growth initiative. So we were happy to see that growth and the contracts that have come along with it to help us to grow. Um, our care team is uh, comprised of a physician, nurse practitioner, a nurse, social worker, and a spiritual counselor, which we borrow from hospice <laughs> on occasion. And then we have the intake coordinator and volunteers help us in the office. Um, so that is the, um, the, the structure of our program. Um, we have changed our design model over the years um, regarding the clinical team and Currently, the nurse practitioner, and this is a little different than some other programs I've spoken with, um, is really the driver of care. So the nurse practitioner sees the patient. Uh, we do have a, a couple doctors that see patients as well, but it's primarily NPs. They go out monthly, uh, see the patient in person. Um, we obviously did quite a bit of telehealth during COVID. And then the nurse and the social worker are um, basically the social workers offered on admission. Most patients do accept social work support. The social worker goes out in person at least the first time. And then based on the care plan, uh, either goes in person or monthly phone calls, sometimes weekly, if there are placement issues and other psychosocial issues. And then the RN is really a support function to the nurse practitioner. So the RN will follow up on medication changes, uh, go out and see the patient at the NP request so, or make monthly phone calls if needed. So it's really become a provider driven model, uh, which is different than when we started. So, but it's, it has worked really well. One of the reasons for that model is uh, reimbursement. We have, uh, fortunate or not, primarily fee-for-service uh, reimbursement, which uh, only pays for the provider. So that helps, that model helps that. Um, the setting of care, we go to the patient's residence. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, we are one of the programs that will go wherever the patient is. So if they are uh, at home in a, a nursing facility, assisted living, if they are homeless, uh, we've definitely seen patients very difficult to reach, but when we do, it's um, it's very rewarding. Uh, shelters, um, temporary housing, we'll, we'll go wherever the patient is. Um, we also offer provider-based care in certain hospitals. Uh, we'll provide inpatient palliative care services. 
Uh, we do utilize telehealth um, that started in 2020, as for many of you with COVID, and it was very well received by our patients. Um, they ask for it. They want it now. And some prefer telehealth to in person. So we almost have to twist arms to get out and see them in person, um, some of them. So um, our, our preferred method is, is an in-person visit, uh, but we do engage in telehealth with all of our different disciplines. Our program delivery system is the same for all patients and all payers. So um, there's really um, an inequity there because our contracts vary quite a bit in what the expectations are of service delivery. Um, but we, uh, it was decided at a, a corporate high level that we're going to provide the same care to all patients, regardless of reimbursement. So the clinicians you see listed and the disciplines are provided and offered to every patient on our program. Um, we have a number of uh, contracted payers, but regarding Medi-Cal, we are contracted with Medi-Cal and we um, have four Medi-Cal managed care organizations we're currently contracted with. Um, next slide. So strategic partners, uh, these were the key partners that came to mind uh, that we work with and really try to focus on uh, the health plans, the hospitals and health systems, uh, palliative care clinics, oncology offices, community providers at, in general. It could be primary care or the specialist that's uh, caring for that patient. Um, home health, and then risk-based medical groups. So those are the, um, the key strategic partners. Um, they have all been very supportive and um, we're, we're getting referrals from all of these different sources. So we really focus our attention um, in diversifying our attention to all of these strategic partners and helping us with growth. And um, a key component with each and every one is collaboration and communication. It's, it takes time, but it's very important. And it's, it's actually the best way that we've grown our program is just through, uh, through connecting with these various uh, strategic partners and letting them know who we are um, and providing education about what we can do. Um, we, one thing that we do, and I'm not sure if all, if all palliative programs do this, but we found it extremely well received is when a patient's admitted to our program, the RN does the initial admission. And then a, so a nurse practitioner goes out, hopefully within a couple days uh, to provide a consultative visit. We send the admission note um, along with a welcome letter, basically informing the provider who we are and that we've taken this patient on and welcome phone calls, little blurb about what home-based palliative care does. Uh, and then we also send all clinician notes to the community providers identified by the patient, so primary care or specialists. And then um, we send discharge summary if they were to discharge from our program. Hey, Next slide. Hey, uh, excuse me, it's Monique. I just, I'm so sorry. I have to keep an eye on the time here. So you have about 11 sure. minutes left. I just wanted to okay. give a gentle reminder. Thank you so all right. much. Thank you. So regarding innovation and developing and strengthening strategic partnerships, um, it's very important to meet the payer requirements and to be flexible. As I said, our contracts, um, are they vary. So you have to identify what the requirements are within each contract and then meet, um, meet the model that's been defined. And that's been a little bit of a challenge, but we, um, we've figured out an internal process that's really helped with that. Um, educate and collaborate with our community providers. Uh, we do that as, as much as we possibly can. I, I work with our hospice sales team even to try to get out to lunch meetings at doctor's offices, wherever we can go to educate and explain uh, community-based palliative care. Um, data is another really important factor, uh, obviously for the health plans, but it's important for the palliative program, obviously, um, themselves to track things like uh, advanced care planning initiatives, post DNR status. I have a long list here, which I won't read, but all of those things help us measure quality and make sure we're providing uh, the best care possible. Program structure should demonstrate quality. So uh, things like weekly contact, monthly IDT, collaboration with providers, those are all really important to the success of your program. Next slide. Impact. So what is important to our strategic partners? Uh, decreased utilization um, of other medical services such as hospitalizations, home health, and skilled nursing, uh, early conversion to hospice, decreased health care costs at end of life, and increased patient and family satisfaction along with patient 
compliance with clinical recommendations. That's one thing I think our home-based palliative care really has to offer is we're in the home, we're seeing these patients that often are not compliant with their doctor visits or medication regimen, and we really have made an impact in that area. Um, next slide. Okay, challenge, uh, reimbursement. So I'll just touch on this briefly. <laughs> um, we have, um, Basically, we use this challenge as to ensure sustainability. And so this is probably something, again, much of the audience focuses on, and that is creating a sustainable program while providing a quality care. We have currently three reimbursement models uh, that we've engaged in with payers, and that is fee for service, which is consultative um, per member per month or case rate. Um, which is under our hospice NPI number, uh, and the fee for service is under the medical group we created. So that's how we've chosen to, to uh, deal with those two forms of reimbursement. And then we're entertaining our first value based pay for performance uh, agreement right now. Um, regarding reimbursement sources, we, um, we are paid through Medi Cal fee for service, Medi Cal managed care. Medicare Part B, which um, is our biggest reimbursement um, form of reimbursement and therefore uh, the most challenging because it's a fee for service model, which is, is not a sustainable reimbursement for us right now. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to changes there, hopefully. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans, managed care, uh, HMOs, commercial, PPO, EPO, ACO, all those acronyms, uh, those are all different uh, types of contracts that we hold. Next slide. Building a sustainable program. Efficiencies and utilization is a very important topic. Um, really, what I focused on first when I came into this role as the director was the sustainable staffing model. Um, our primary cost for home-based palliative care is the patient, direct patient care. Um, so after we started to uh, really focus on budget and sustainability, uh, we had to make some changes. So we cut our, uh, our, our direct patient care staff by almost 50% and then started to look at other ways to um, you know, increase contracts and that sort of thing, which has been really helpful. Another thing we use are volunteers. Um, I love our volunteers. We have two right now. One makes our patient satisfaction calls. She does a wonderful job, very heartfelt call to patients uh, we call uh, week five and then every six months or as needed if determined that they need um, to be checked in on more frequently. And we also have volunteers running reports for us. Uh, the other thing we do, what's been talk about innovation is our palliative care staff, whenever we have time, our RN will do the hospice admission. So if we convert to hospice, they will do that admission. Uh, if we have time and hospice is busy, we also send our nurses to, to, help, uh, to help out the hospice side. Um, Capacity threshold, you just I, I just recommend there if you have growth targets to make sure it's sustainable and that you can um, support the care uh, through the growth and that you have the staff to provide that care. Uh, review and, um, analytics and make sure your goals are realistic. And then the last thing is economies of scale. Higher census we have found is helping somewhat with our indirect cost per case. So our, our office staff and all the different, the billing and all the different things that go on behind the scenes um, have really are helped with the volume and increased revenue. Next slide. Innovation surprise. So our innovation surprise, I put down Medi-Cal managed care organizations because when we first uh, entered our first uh, agreement back in 2018, we were a little nervous. You know, what is this going to be like working with Medi-Cal and our program, um, you know, challenges to be sustainable. And we've actually found the Medi-Cal managed care plans to best uh, complement the services and program needs that our patients have. So it's been a really surprising, wonderful relationship that continues to grow. We have some wonderful contracted uh, Medi-Cal managed care providers uh, plans out there. Uh, we do our joint IDTs together. We um, collaborate, we contact their care plan managers sometimes when needed. And they're, um, for the most part, willing to joint marketing, which has been a great way to get, uh, you know, our name out there, not just our particular program, but what is community-based palliative care and what can we offer the provider community. Uh, and plan priorities match our priorities, and that's been really refreshing. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, takeaways. So in summary, 
Um, I recommend uh, just kind of putting together a summary of everything we just looked at over the last couple of minutes. Maintain collaborative efforts with your strategic partners. Share quality indicators to illustrate your program's value. Maximize efficiencies through innovation. And remember, we're all here to enhance the patient and family experience and outcome. Thanks again. Wow, Phaedra, that was amazing. Um, what I think uh, what is certainly common is your passion and the passion of your program to really reach out, both promote quality, but also build these very strategic partnerships. So just we'll have one or two questions. You've had some really terrific comments here about this win-win when uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans and their private care contracting partners work together. It's a win-win first and foremost for members. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sustainability going forward? Is this the, the, the approach, those measures that you talked about and those efforts, are you going to be able to sustain that? Talk a little bit about the future, certainly as we hopefully, gosh willing, exit this COVID period. Right. Yeah, I think sustainability, a lot of it has to do with um, our contracted partners. I think uh, you know, focusing on growth, um, further defining, you know, community-based palliative care. I still think it's forming and growing. We're still, payers are still trying to figure out sustainable models for reimbursement because I know they want us to succeed as much as we want to succeed. I think we offer a valuable service. So I really think this, this year, I mean, my focus really is to try to more time to get out of the office and focus on these strategic partners and work with the health plans to really grow and offer value to show the value to everybody um, through outreach. So that's it. And so in, in the payers, equal reimbursement. So as far as sustainability, if I can continue to grow my network um, of contracted payers, I will, I will be more sustainable as a program. And on that note, can you just pull that thread a little bit about this standard model of care that independent of these different sources of reimbursement that you really maintain that? Talk a little bit about the decision. Now, you also had to really look at your internal staff and make sure that it was efficient and you were uh, addressing that uh, in a very constructive way. Talk a little bit about the, those aspects, please. Yeah, sure. So so back when, when we were, you know, the pilot, it you know, we we struggled with finding out what is the best model of care, which, you know, and I read all the articles and went to the conferences and I saw the different ways that other uh, programs were functioning out there. We, we really evolved to this. So right now, this is the best pro uh, the best setup we've had regarding the way we have the discipline set up. And, um, and as far as the care that we're providing, we found some redundancy in setting an RN, which is not, you know, that's a costly type of care. And the, and the, and the nurse practitioner every month, they were both going every month to see the patient. And, and we stopped back and said, is this what the patient wants? I mean, it's a lot of visits and is this what they need? And we felt the clinical component can very well be managed by the nurse practitioner. They're the ones prescribing the meds. So we just kind of morphed our model to really target what is needed most and focus on that. And um, we do we do telephone calls when we can because it's a much more efficient way to provide, you know, provide the care. So the current model is working really well. Our social worker is loved by our patients. As you know, there's so much resource management with these patients and, and family dynamics. And, and I just, I, I love our, our social worker. So right now the model's working really well. All right. Well, we're going to stop there. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to invite you back with Dr. Gordon and with our next set of presenters for this 15 minute uh, discussion before we wrap up the day. And um, so thank you, Phaedra, uh, if you're uh, able to turn off your camera. And I'd like to invite uh, Tapinder Dillon and Tracy Heitzman to come on board. And they are both with the health plan of San Joaquin. And Tapinder is the manager of case management. And Tracy Heitzman is the executive director of clinical operations and they are going to share their palliative care innovation. So uh, thank you both for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. And if we can squeeze in a few minutes at the end for some Q&A, great, and then we'll move into the larger session. Thank you both. Thank you, Monique. Hi, good morning, everyone. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so with Health Plan of San Joaquin is serving since 1996 to the Central Valley here and we are a publicly sponsored program and is one of the leading medical managed care provider here in San Joaquin and in Stanislaus County. So currently we are serving approximately 384,000 members um, in both uh, counties. 
So can we go to the next slide, please? So our innovation partners, so we have two palliative agencies who are working with the health plan. Um, the first is the Pacific Palliative Care. So Pacific Palliative Care serve the members who are residing in uh, San Joaquin County and the Community Care Choices is another palliative agency who serves the members located in the Stanislaus County. So these both agency along with palliative, they also do um, hospice. So we have some members who do um, some get transition from the palliative program to the um, hospice. And when we had this partnership, the innovation started in July 2017. Um, there was, uh, you know, the critical part of this was engagement, how we are going to engage these, um, you know, members also along with that the providers. So this is where we started partnering with the local hospitals. Um, clinics and also the community providers uh, along with the members and their caregivers. So, um, so we partner with the local hospitals where the palliative care agencies would go into the hospital, discuss with the member about the palliative care program and that's where they started the enrollment. So that was a big impact on where the member was seen face to face and was um, discussed about the program, the benefits, and the same thing uh, was going into the clinics as well. So the palliative care agencies, they were visiting the doctor's offices, especially like oncology um, and other outpatient settings where they were going to the provider's offices and discussing and talking about the palliative care program with the members and enrolling them there. Um, and we also found out that how important it is to have the engagement, not only the member and their caregivers. Um, so along with having partnership with the local hospitals and the clinics, we also um, educated our own staff here at the health plan, where we educated all the nurses working in the case management and inpatient side um, transition of care nurses to um, review the cases for members they receive, whether they can you know, benefit from this program. We have members who had complex care needs where they were struggling with all multiple health conditions or having a lot of other um, care needs. So this is where the case management also started referring the members to those two agencies and uh, um, that you know have that impact on those members along with not only referring but also making sure the member is receiving that care and we still stayed in contact with those members and um, have that um, you know partnership with those two agencies. Um, next slide please. So this is what um, patient engagement. So not only the case management, we also have from the inpatient setting within the health plan and also from the outpatient side where we were referring member to the palliative agencies. And then our, uh, we do a weekly call to those agencies to follow up on those referrals, making sure the members are getting connected with them. And then if there's any barrier and they're not able to connect with the member and we do our best you know, to connect them with finding an alternative number. Um, in this valley, we have quite a few um, challenges like homelessness is one of them. So our, both of our palliative agencies are pretty flexible where they are going to, um, to the park, even under the bridges, um, going to people's houses just to talk about the program and enrolling mm -hmm. them uh, into this program. Next slide, please. So the challenge we had is, I think we all have that, the COVID impact. So that changed a lot. Um, so with the COVID impact, uh, the palliative care teams were not able to go into the hospital or even to the outpatient setting where they can go and um, assess the member and enroll into the program. So that was one of the biggest barrier. There was a limited access to it. And on, Along with that, the patients were very uncomfortable. Some of those patients denied having home visits because they were, um, because of the COVID, you know, they do not want anyone coming to their house. Um, that increased the member isolation. So the isolation was already there, but um, along with the COVID, it kind of heightened more. Uh, so that, that was another challenge for us. And COVID conflicting information, so, you know, um, 
some of those members were not willing to have it. immunization. Vaccination was a bigger, um, you know, um, conflict for them not having, um, even though providing in services trainings to those members for by our case managers, but still we have that challenge where we have members who were not, um, you know, uh, agreeing to having the vaccination. So, so those were the challenges that uh, I think we all faced. Um, and then um, next slide, please. So our response along with both of our palliative care agencies was, you know, how we can alleviate that isolation and how we can alleviate their other challenges is um, our team where we were assessing more behavioral health needs. We found out that we are referring more members to the behavioral health now because of the isolation. Along with that, the agencies also increased their telehealth visit um, and their touch-based frequent calls. So touch-based frequent calls were only not only just to talk about their treatment plan, how they're it was just to see how they are doing it, just a normal, you know, call to find out how's everything going. So that was increased. Um, and also the involvement of the caregiver evolved a lot too with this because where members were not comfortable or member were not uh, uh, you know comfortable doing the telehealth visit so they were not very computer savvy where they can uh, you know talk through the computer or through their phone so that's where their caregivers and their family members you know um, were involved so both the agencies, along with the health plan staff, we educated those uh, caregivers on how to, um, you know, provide the support and how to they can um, help the member for those telehealth visits. And not only with the palliative care agencies, but also with the primary care doctor visit with the specialist. So it was more telehealth, um, you know, so that kind of helped the members to get the care they needed. Next slide, please. So the outcome, um, it's uh, my apologies. We do not have enough data yet, but definitely uh, we'll get more in the future. But right now, uh, from December 2020 to 2021, we sent... Um, total of 491 palliative referrals to both of our agencies, Community Care Choices and Pacific Palliative. Like I told, we do weekly call to the palliative agencies to follow up on those referrals, how's everyone doing, whether they were able to connect with those members or not. Along with that, we also do monthly uh, meetings with the uh, partners to see um, how's everything going, is there any barrier we can help with, and if there's anything, uh, you know, um, challenging, because there's a lot of um, information that we can have access to as a health plan compared to those agencies. So that is where we are helping them to improve patient engagement, um, with, you know, with this collaboration. Next slide, please. So the innovation takeaway was the main, you know, with this COVID, we addressing the isolation that was a significantly impact, you know, the health outcomes of our members. Um, and along with that, family members and caregivers were provided more much support. Um, those were struggling with the serious health conditions. And there was more, um, take, you know, the importance of frequent interaction. So having those touch-based calls uh, um, to those members, you know, with that, it uh, kind of alleviate, but still, you know, um, it was a challenge. And then with, with the telehealth visits, with the touch-based calls, um, calls from our case managers that they are not alone, we are there to help them. And, and I would say like a big praise to those caregivers and the family members who involved into the care of their uh, loved ones and they helped uh, um, the agencies along with the health plan to ensure that members are receiving the care, quality care. And I think that is that was the last slide. So I don't know if I did it more 
fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally fine. We have a couple of questions for you. And then let me just remind everybody, uh, these are your peers. So many of you are for sure doing very similar, creative, innovative, heart-driven efforts to reach members and provide quality care. So please share that in the chat because we, we're going to bring everybody back together. But before we do that, Depender and Tracy we want to ask you a little bit more uh, thinking about the caregivers because oftentimes uh, patients, of course, uh, some patients are able to engage and oftentimes it's the caregiver. Can you talk a little bit more about building Building trust and communicating with caregivers, both through the innovation, but also as, as COVID starts to lift a little bit, that role and what's what's the impact been, especially on caregivers and whether their loved ones use the emergency room or are they really referring back to these two um, contracted providers? Talk a little bit about that. So um, with the um caregiver involvement definitely there was a decrease in ear visits there was a decrease in hospitalization definitely um, and then providing them the education you know over the phone and we also offered video not only just the telehealth visit just for phone calls but also the you know um, video visits through the team uh, I have few members who were very comfortable doing those video calls with me having that face-to-face -face conversation along with their um, caregiver uh, was really, you know, great. Like I can share my own, um, some of the examples that I had with some of those members, mm. we refer to palliative, but their caregivers were so uh, connected with us and that they would give us a call back and how, you know, they need help with. But we also encourage them to use more, um, instead of going to the ER or calling the PCP, how they can involve the palliative care team, you know, with the, uh, with the care or the questions they have related to. Um, so definitely it was, I do not have much data right now, but that is something we are working on mm -hmm. to get, you know, how COVID impacted on the enrollment right. side of it. Definitely we did so many referrals and we still continue to do it but I'm going to have that data more, like I said before, um, for the future, definitely. And actually, we also want to look up internally too, um, what's the enrollment data is going, is there any impact, you know, from the COVID, how it was going? Yeah. But now with the, you know, that this is endemic now, you know, it's ending. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, so right. yes, the things are better. They started doing the home visits. Um, they do the drive-through okay. visits too, you know, where they just knock on the door if member sure. don't answer the phone and see where they are. And they always call us, you know, these agencies, they have our numbers. They always call us, say, we have not reached out to this member. And sometimes those members may go back to the hospital, you know, they get discharged, they go back again. So sure. this is where we are there to help them because it's not about only just sending the referrals. No, it's more about how we are going to support those members. Um, I worked as a hospice nurse, so it, I know how um, important it is for the people to know what palliative care is. You know, most exactly. of the people think that palliative is just end of life. No, sure. I have seen patients graduating from these programs. So it's, you know. So, so where there's a question here, Tinder, can you talk about the average duration of enrollment? Uh, you have these two contracted providers. So on average, in, in terms of months, this was from Dr. Michael Fratkin. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little so bit about that? The average enrollment when we are sending the referral is within a month, within three to four weeks, they mm -hmm. are enrolling the member. They're or if not, they are doing their first initial assessment, you know, going to the house. Yeah. So they start right away within the two to three day period. So they start reaching out to the member. And uh, most of the time, it's within that, you know, 30 day time frame they do um, connect with the member. If not, then they definitely, you know, we have some members who's, who are not in, you know, um, enrollment or not connected within that month period but most of them are yes so so the actual the, there was an extension of that question was how long are they enrolled in receiving palliative care so so sorry if that was yeah. confusing yeah you yeah, know so mm -hmm. the benefit the palliative benefit they are some of our members are there for years you okay. know and uh, 
I have not received the recent data, but from the last year, I have noticed some of them are there just for only six months or for one year and they're graduating from the program. And some they are there and some they transition from, uh, I do not have exact number, but there are some transitioning to hospice as well. So we don't get that much data from the, uh, that, that I found out lately. So we will definitely be asking those you know, partners to have that. Mm -hmm. and, and while we have like another question or so for, for this team, we encourage all of you because we're going to open this up in a few minutes and bring back uh, the other innovation presenters. I think I'd be very curious. Um, so it, it, you've got some some encouragement here about uh, data just in general. I think this was in response to so a question about using claims data that might be a little bit different thread for now, but for sure the chat is active. So thank you all for, for sharing that. Uh, just a quick thought about you, you had talked about this external engagement, of course, your partnerships, working on behalf of uh, palliative care members, going into hospitals and, and palliative, in, excuse me, into PCP offices. But you also mentioned that you really were developing internal staff, health plan staff, and their understanding of and fluidity with palliative care. Can you talk a little bit more about the emphasis on that as a complement to this external engagement and building of partnerships with uh, patients and family members, as well as other providers in the community. But talk about that balance of this internal address that you've done with your own staff. So within our own staff, we are doing um, trainings, you know, in mm -hmm. services okay. specific to the palliative care programs. And every new staff who joins our uh, team gets that training. So that way they are familiar with that. These are the benefits a member can have, you know, being as you know, health plan member. So that okay. is, you know, that is internally we do and we make sure. And then we, everything is um, through the, you know, electronic now. So we do provide them uh, training on how to refer those members to those agencies, what their contact information is. So everything is provided to the team so that they can um, utilize and, you know, provide those services. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Uh, let's see, we've got um, a, another minute or so, but what I think might be really helpful is to bring everybody back and we'll spend uh, the next 10, 15 minutes asking questions. So with that, maybe what we'd like to do is invite Dr. Gordon back and invite Phaedra back. Okay, so uh, again, this is an opportunity for all of you to please put your questions in chat or even comments. So uh, one of the things that came up, I think it was while you were speaking favor, was whether you include in your model PT and OT. So physical therapy and occupational therapy is part of a clinical approach. I don't know if this is anything uh, any of you would like to respond to. Is that something that's been part of your model or is that sort of a segue referral to home health or do you work in partnership? Yeah, about I, that. I'd like to, to respond to that because we, we do not offer physical therapy or any kind of therapies that normally are handled through a home health agency. But one thing you notice, and, and you saw home health agencies were on my strategic partner list, because uh, in some ways they're competitors, because some home health agencies offer kind of care. But what I'm finding is most of the ones that our patients are receiving home health from are not uh, competitors at all. They're actually strategic mm -hmm. partners. So I've had three cases, three different agencies uh, tell a mutual patient that they had to disenroll from palliative care or they could no longer come out and provide home health. So I called up and spoke with um, the director of their program and talked and got to know them. And we actually ended up partnering on patient care, introducing our teams uh, together to, to provide actually more comprehensive care. So it was a real win-win. And, and now I've, I've worked with these agencies, you know, I see additional mm -hmm receiving home health. So it's actually been, it's been a wonderful partnership that I hope to grow even more, but we, we do not provide that. We leave that to the home health agency. <laughs> yeah. So sort of looking for opportunity, but it's right in the spirit of building these partnerships. Um, Marv, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, you had mentioned that there is this uh, gap actually that you're trying to bridge with your community health workers, but more broadly with clinical service delivery, um, medically, clinically based and community services. Can you talk a little bit more about this unique role of CHWs? Of course, you had shared that they're sort of getting this very uh, thoughtful embedded training and time with, with uh, their pr provider teams, but just in general, this gap, I think more broadly between community, because I think it's very relevant for CalAIM. It's trying to take 
some of these needed programs and services that engage a lot of community supports and integrate that uh, for members in need, many of whom are palliative care uh, eligible members. So talk a little bit about that gap and what you think should be done. Let me start with the basic principle, which is not all palliative members are the same. Hmm. You know, there's ones that do require the symptom control. You're going to need a nurse practitioner or a doctor. They're prescribing meds. On the other hand, you get to the feudal medical care. Someone on ventilator, no chance of recovery. You know, probably your social worker is probably your best person to go in and talk with them. Some are treatable. We had one lady with, uh, the problem is she had a mesh in her abdomen, kept getting repeated infections, was having major sepsis twice a month, but she was treatable by finding a surgeon who would remove the mesh. And then you get to the social determinants. Uh, Lightbridge down in San Diego, they've been doing a beautiful job managing a member who lives in his car. They arranged where to meet them, and the telephone was the key, reminding them, did you fill your meds? Any problems for the weekend? Do you have a doctor's appointment? There was a structure. It's like, all you really need there is a coach. And I think one of the speakers mentioned behavioral health. So to me, it's what does the patient need? Now we'll go back to what you said. They need someone they can trust who can talk their language. And I hate to say it, as good as we are as doctors or nurses, I hate to say, I don't think we really get down to that level. Mm -hmm. Problem is the community healthcare worker, they're not trained in medical or managed care. And that's why I have to give them just enough information. It's one of the things I like about the hub pathway model. Mm -hmm. Here is your social determinant checklist. When you find blank, here's the pathway to solve it. Here's a computer system where you put your data so we can analyze it. But I truly believe the community health care workers are an untapped asset. And yet, but we need to train them and we need to be specific about what we want. It's probably something I forgot to put there is conveying my expectation to them. Because again, they're not, I don't want to make them doctors. I don't want to make them, you know, coordinators for managed health care. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things is, enough knowledge to know where are your resources whom to call but i believe uh in these communities people tend to do what their peers do what their mm-hmm. neighbors do uh, i know with the grandkids you watch it all the parents talk with each other mm-hmm. what is the opinion about covid vaccination for children it's probably whatever all the parents in the school are talking about exactly so i just think we need to think a little differently about quote, medical health care, because I think a lot of it is, goes back to social determinants, community support. I mean, that I mean, your question? or Yeah, I, I, again, it, yes, of course. And, and I think that there is this opportunity, but it just sounds like it's a really collaborative effort, whether you're using your community, Absolutely. building the network partner, but also Honestly, it's people to people. It's working with the community health workers, of course, who have just tremendous contributions and value, like any person on the team. So that's terrific. I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about like next steps. Like you've done this innovation, you're still doing it. How do you imagine this innovation informing other parts of your various programs? And how can you kind of move forward with your sustainability plans, but also integrate lessons learned? So What's the future look like after uh, for the next year or so, again, as our landscape ch- changes again with hopefully a, a much uh, less restrained uh, stay at home order? So thoughts about this, these innovations and where they will play in to your other efforts. Uh, Tapinder, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think, you know, we have some internal things going on right now with uh, quality and compliance that are just wonderful because that's an area that, you uh, I feel like we could have paid more attention to. We provide all these measures and things and and matrix to the health plans, but really do we, you know, what kind of audit infrastructure do we have? So we're, we're doing some internal building right now that will really help us as a program ensure quality. We're auditing charts. I'm meeting with, and I've been gracious enough to allow the hospice compliance team to, to start uh, helping us with some of these endeavors and reviewing our nurse practitioner consults and continuity uh, between the team members and notes 
notes, uh, the clinical notes. So we're doing some of that internally. And then, as I said, this next year, I just plan to really try to get out there. And, and I really do think there's a lot of misperception on community-based palliative care still. I, I think a lot of providers don't, don't understand the value. They don't understand, like uh, what Dr. Gordon was saying, there's so much of this is psychosocial. It's, yes, there's a medical need, but so often our social worker is the one going in and and come to terms with the family and getting the patient on hospice where they're going to get more comprehensive care. They are. They're just, it's a richer benefit. So we're, um, we're dealing with a lot of different scenarios, different needs, um, a, a much more diverse population, I would say than, uh, and not, I don't mean eth ethically, but um, ethnicity. I, I mean, you know, different age, age groups and, and hospice is a much more subset, right, of, of a terminal patient. So there's, um, it's, it's complex. It's very, very complex. And so it's just continuing to, to develop the program, provide the best care that we can, and then getting out there with our part, strategic partners and, and getting everybody on board to, uh, to seeing the value and referring to us because we, we definitely, I think that's something as well. It's, it's underutilized benefit for sure. Right, and engaging them in this quality assurance process that they are an equal partner with you for sure. Yeah. Tapinder, can you talk a little bit about your innovation and where you see it going from here? Uh, you've had to do some adjustments uh, for sure over the, the period for which it's been running, during which it's been running. So thoughts about that? So, um, <clears throat> so for the coming like this is something new to me as well so I just started working on this so I'm looking into more having more collaboration with the agencies who serve those programs to the community um, having more uh, interdisciplinary meetings not only just meet we met every month not only that just more about patients you know what how's that is going you know um and also um having um i really like the idea for those chws you know and mm -hmm. dr marvin was talking about you know um so that is something that you know um we can take back and talk about that um that is you know i'm um, also getting data more on the inpatient side for ER visits, you know, uh, transition from palliative to hospice. So that is something that uh, we will definitely be working with our um, clinical team to get, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, you wanna add something? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I would just add that I think we all have a really good opportunity here now that mm -hmm. uh, at least at present, things seem to be in a little bit better situation to really have the opportunity to renew our efforts uh, and kind of shore up everything. I think one of the things about COVID that we all recognize pretty clearly is that not only impacted all the members that we're dealing with, our patients that we're dealing with, but all, also our staff, community resources and so forth. So we've lost, I would say, a lot of um, folks that were dealing you know, in the front line with all these relationships that we had built and these processes we'd put in place. Some of those individuals also took part in the great resignation uh, and, and those, mm -hmm. uh, community-based organizations and partners may have had difficulty in refilling those positions as well. So I think that it is gonna take a concerted effort to kind of, all right, check in with all the partners, where are we now? Um, this is, we are committed to, um, you know, you know, brushing off our hands and saying, okay, let's move forward. And, and what do we need to, to continue to grow this in a quality way? I also agree um, that the ability to have some solid data um, is really important to drive, uh, you know, next steps uh, after we get things moving again. Um, and so collecting the data that we already have in place and then seeing how we can drill down further uh, what's important to us in order to move forward is really important. So Marv, you're the last one to answer. We've heard really uh, using and leveraging CHWs. You've really uh, presented on that, getting more data, auditing, but also really um, continuing to work in this very collaborative and communicative way with your partners. Your thoughts about this integration going forward and lessons learned and sort of your big sky vision here. Yeah, quick summary is we need data. And I think everyone has said the same thing. COVID was terrible. It really ruined kind of our chances to get good data. So we're starting over. When you to get your data, you do your analysis. You prove your value, that new proposition. That's how I go to my boss and say, I need funding 
for this. And once I can fund my community-based organizations, then we can expand. So I think that's it's really goes back to everyone putting their data together. And I'll just mention, like we have on the palliative side, we have the um, our CAIC, our Advanced Donors Collaborative, for health plans pulling their data to see how cost-effective palliative care is. And I think it's one of the things we have not really done is start all of us collaborating to get the data, to make the value proposition so we can convince the payers this is a sound investment. Uh, well, that is a powerful statement here. Uh, let, let's take a look a little bit about some of our comments here. Because I, again, um, we really thank you all for those uh, thoughts about sort of where you're going to, uh, your leverage points here. We have a question here about chaplains or valuable members of the team. And I don't know if there's a comment from any of you about the role of chaplains as you think about these uh, partnerships that you're working on and develop. So let me stop there. Anybody want to shout out about chaplains? I would just say, I think they need chaplain services available. Okay. Don't necessarily have to have a chaplain on staff. Because once again, it varies which patients need it, which don't. Okay, so making those available. Uh, we have from, from Dr. Michael Fratnikin, I'm really enthusiastic about expanding the community health worker workforce. Uh, he recognizes they are the same, of course, intelligent, caring individuals um, that like the privilege he enjoys, but really deserving this role on the team. And Dabinder was making the comment, you know, that's something that you'll consider going forward. So as you hear about this and anybody else listening in, if there's something that you think, you know, you may want to try that. We have one question for you, Dr. Gordon. Continuing this thought about CHWs, how do you think about having the CHWs help provide education to palliative care organizations on member trust and connection? Kind of similar to the same way you educate CHWs about health and managed care systems. So it's, um, they would actually help to provide that education and really using their own uh, expertise as, as members of the team to help others understand the valuable role of palliative care. Your, your thoughts. Now, one of the reasons we formed the Neighborhood Network in San Diego is to get the community-based organizations to work together. The question, which is still not answered, I want feedback from them. What is your experience? And even before we go to the palliative care, go to your payer, to the health plan. I want to know your experience. Tell me what we're not doing well, what we could do better. The ba like I mentioned some of the barriers. I realized they don't know the managed care system. What do I do when they say the referral is lost? Uh, they're talking about this A1C thing and diabetes. What does it mean? So it's a mutual training, but I think you hit on a key point. We need the community health care workers to educate and train us just as much as we, the medical people, need to help and managed care people need to train them. So no, absolutely. These are our and what you call them, agents, but our representatives in the community. And what we've developed over the past four to five years is I think the community-based organizations now trust the payers, the health plans, because I really believe five years ago, we were viewed as the evil empire. Now they view us as a partner and we can actually have open and honest discussions. So that's step one. And step two is just what you said. Give us some feedback. And then Absolutely. together we can help train palliative care providers. And I think the other thing going way back a couple of discussions ago, is there something we're missing? Office staff. I know when I was in mm -hmm. practice, my office staff knew my patients and they knew which ones. So they always chatted. And I think we train office staffs. We can also increase the number of palliative care referrals. Well, on that note, I am going to thank all of our innovation presenters. And just for all of you listening, uh, boy, th this group of extraordinary individuals, this is a lot of work. They were just amazing and putting together and sharing their innovations, lots of extra time. But it was in the spirit of um, offering all of the potential that palliative care provides. So we just want a, a big thank you to all of you. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Judy Thomas for our closing remarks. Thank you, everybody.